Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. You know, that's, that's so true. You can, you're snared by the words of your mouth, both the good and the bad. So uh, even if, you, uh, if you're saying good things, then you're going to be snared by that, and that's good news, I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> you know, if you say something and it's like, man, I've just talked myself into something good, and that's, uh, that's a good thing, you know, talk yourself, because a lot of the time we talk ourselves into a hole, or into a, we, we talk ourselves down, or we talk ourselves into a bad place, but, you know, how about for a change we talk, we get snared by the good words of our mouth? Wouldn't that be a good thing? So, thank you. This morning I played that little clip um, because um, the title of my message this morning is God Remembers, God Rewards. And um, that clip uh, from the Passion movie, and just in all of its, its horror there, but you can still see that even on the cross, the compassion of Jesus Christ was, was actually, it was greater than ever because at that moment, he forgave every single person. You've seen all those people there laughing at him and mocking him. He, was being, he had already been beaten and scourged, and now they were doing the other, uh, the other rituals of the crucifixion where he was pierced in the side um, and all of those different things. And it was interesting when I was studying from a message that um, one thing that they didn't do that they normally did in crucifixion was they didn't break Jesus' legs. But that was a normal part of the crucifixion, and there was a prophecy in the Old Testament that prophesied that, that his bones would not be broken, and, and they weren't. So that was an, an awesome day, and that he had these two uh, thieves, and now a lot of us, we, we grew up in Sunday school uh, uh, hearing the story of the, the Jesus and the two thieves. But the Bible doesn't say an awful lot about them. Um, but... Uh, um, if you can remember, they both start off by railing on Jesus. I mean, they are, they are, they are, they are hanging on crosses next to him, mocking him. And uh, everyone in the crowd is saying, well, you're Jesus. Why don't you save yourself? You know, if you're the son of God, you can just get down off of this cross. You can take control of the situation. But they never understood what was going on. And so um, one of them, somehow, reality dawns on him that he is hanging next to the Son of God. Now, I don't know if that was divine, because they had been there for some time, for a short time. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how many hours they may have been there. But either the Holy Spirit divinely revealed to that man that this is Jesus, the Son of God, or perhaps he had, you see, Jesus' fame had spread throughout. Many people had heard of Jesus. Maybe he already had heard of Jesus before. I don't know. But anyway, the main thing is this. The thief does four things. And, you know, the Bible's full of types and shadows. It's full of, you know, there's so much, so much in through the Old Testament into the New Testament that is, there's a pattern And so the thief does four things. Number one, he admits that he's there because he deserves to be there. So the first thing he does is he he has an admission of guilt. Because remember, he says to the other thief, listen, give it a rest. We deserve to be here. This man has done nothing at all. And just remember, we're only a couple of weeks away from Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and I'm going to just share a short message in part one and part two next week, so that when we get to Easter, we're, we're ready in our hearts, that it's so strong in our hearts that we know, we remember, we remember exactly what that sacrifice was and the gift that it produced. Number two, he rebukes the other criminal the other thief on the cross. Now, I don't know if they knew one another or not, but he says to this guy, stop it. He rebukes the other criminal. 
It's almost as if he's realizing that the path of life that we were on is wrong. And it's almost a kind of, him doing that in front of Jesus is almost like a kind of a repentance for his past life. Because he's acknowledging with his words that their path has been the wrong path, okay? So are you following this? Admission of guilt, repentance. Number three, he confirms Jesus' innocence. That was the third thing he did, he done. He says, this man has done no wrong. So he confirms Jesus' innocence. And number four, what does he say? He says, Lord. He acknowledges Jesus as Lord. And he asks that Jesus remember him. And of course, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't realize um, that the subtitles might have been a bit low and maybe some of you couldn't read them. But he says, he says uh, this day you will be with me in paradise. So that's, the thief does those four things. And the fourth is that he acknowledges that Jesus is Lord and he asks that Jesus remember him. And, uh, and, and so it's like almost like his salvation was gifted to him right there and then, just by going through that series of steps. And just like Joe said this morning, if that is something that you don't have, it's as easy as, as reaching out to receive it and saying thank you for it. There are some other things we have to confess, but that's, it's as easy as that. And so Jesus says, yeah, today you'll be with me in paradise. And um, that just, the whole thing of remembrance is so important. God never forgets us. I want to tell you that this morning. He never forgets you. He knows everything about you. He knows, he knows the back rooms of your life. He knows, the, he knows everything. There is nothing that God doesn't know. And he has such a strong desire to fulfill his promises. Do you know that God's a God of promises? Because the word is full of promises. He's a God of promises. There's, how many of us here have broken promises? How many of us, we, we break our promises. God is a God of promises and he can never break his promises. Do you believe that? And, uh, but he has such a strong desire to fulfill his promises to, to, for us and to, uh, um, to reward us that's the reason why he remembers us. So it's because he wants to do that. He wants to, and sometimes the promises don't just happen in, when we want them to happen. Isn't that right? And so he keeps an account of everything, never misses anything that we do. And there are times when we get distant from him and even times when we forget him completely, but he never forgets us. Are you thankful for that? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, this is the, uh, the verse that talks about God being a rewarder. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Okay, family, God is longing to reward you. <laughs> He's longing to reward you. Don't ever be confused or, or don't, because sometimes, well, how could, God, how, can, how could God reward me? Because I've just led such, uh, my life has, has, I don't deserve reward. I think that's one of the biggest issues that people face is that they, they just think they're so undeserving. Of, of reward, but God's, it's God's desire to reward. And so if you've got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Malachi chapter three, okay? And this isn't the, we normally go there for a giving message, but not today. So if you've got your Bibles with you, go to Malachi chapter three.
and go to verse 13. And in the New Living Translation, it says here, you have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. You have said terrible things about me. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed. For those who do evil get rich and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. Then comes the promise. Verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll of what? Remembrance. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him. Wow, there's a scroll of remembrance with your name on it or not. A scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. What do you think God's doing there in that passage of scripture? He's addressing some issues. He's like, okay, guys, it's time to address some stuff. It's time to address these issues. Oh, what's the point? What's the point in serving God? What's the point in going, in going to church every Sunday? What's the point in getting up and have my, having my quiet time? I still, as soon as I get in the car and go off to work, everything starts going wrong anyway. What's the point? What's the use in serving God? He's, what, what's he really doing for me? Can any of that sound vaguely familiar? In our own lives, sometimes it's what's the point? My prayers are bouncing off of, it's like a, a glass ceiling. I start to pray in the morning and my mouth goes dry. And I feel an overwhelming sense of guilt that I'm not in the right place that I should be with God. It's, it's such a discouraging place to be when you get, when you get up in the morning and you go to, to, to read the word or to try and pray and you feel as if there's nobody there. We've, we've suffered, things have been hard, things have been tough. What have we got to gain? So, do any of you remember this scripture verse? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have com committed repulsive and unspeakable deeds. There is no one who does good. That's in Psalm 14, Psalm 14 verse 1. So God's addressing the issues there. They were even saying, you know, what's the difference between the, the righteous and the wicked? It's like, you know, the Bible says that, uh, be careful that you don't become puffed up and full of pride because you love someone, you help them, you give, you give things to them, you give to charity. The wicked do the same things. The wicked also love their family. The wicked also give to charity and they, you know, God is saying, be very careful. Don't become, don't think that you're the elite because you do that. There's something else that sets us apart from, from people. There's something else that sets us apart from the unrighteous and the wicked. And that is that we're saved by, we're, we're saved. That's what, that's what sets us apart. That's the only, that's the difference. 
The difference is that you made a decision to turn your life around and before that you had your back was turned to God and you've just changed you've changed position. But God remembers us and he's promised things. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In the New Living Translation, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. I want to read that to you again. Because we have these promises, these are God's promises, all of God's promises, nearly 3,600, 3,600 promises. Is that enough promises for you? Yeah, even one good promise, I'd be, I'd be happy with that. But th- somewhere around over 3,500 promises. Dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. Is there anyone here, including myself, I'm naming myself here, that you can think something immediately comes to mind that you need to cleanse yourself from? Because it's defiling, it's defiling you. And let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. And I've heard it said so many times, you can't be holy. Holiness is, God is holy, only God is holy. But we are, do you know that we are called to be holy? Do you know that we are called unto holiness? Okay, it's (laughs) it's definitely a process, but we're called to that place. So what promise is being talked about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7? In the previous verses, okay, do this for, for your homework. Paul is addressing some issues with the Corinthians, and he tells them basically, if you guys stop compromising yourselves and recognize the dangers of being unequally yoked. Do you know what unequally yoked means? Incompatible. Incompatibility. Do not be unequally yoked. This is very important, especially with the covenant. The, most, the foundation of, for a covenant to work, one of the foundations of a covenant is that you be equally yoked. Otherwise, It's not going to last very long. Do you understand that? Because one person will disagree and the covenant, the partnership will break up because you haven't agreed on the same thing. So he's he's addressing these issues with the Corinthians. He says, stop compromising yourself. Recognize the dangers of being unequally yoked. What does it say after that though? It says that if they do that, God will receive them. And that they will be his sons and his daughters. They'll be his children. So there's a condition there. I will receive you if you recognize that being unequally yoked is dangerous. And will you please stop compromising your lives? Will you please walk into holiness? Will you at least pursue holiness? But up until that time, they're like, what's the point? Say this after me this morning. I am a target. You're a target. Everyone's looking around. You are the target of God's promises. It's like you're walking around with a big bullseye on your back all day long. If you can be in that place where you're, you're, you're uncompromised, it's like God is like, there's Joe, bullseye, shunk. The arrow, it's like the arrow meets its mark. Promise, there's a promise for you. We need to, however, just there's, there's always a word of caution. There's always a balance in life. Never take it for granted that because God has said something that he will surely do it, okay? He will surely do all that he says, but we sometimes do things that offend God, all right? We sometimes do things that are capable of changing God's mind. Okay? Yet we expect him to remain committed to his promises. Yeah? Uh, Come up with loads of illustrations for that. But uh, 
right, we're going to Largs. If you're good, you'll get an ice cream. <laughs> if you're good, you'll get an ice cream cone. All right. By the time you get to Largs, in the car, fighting, carrying on. Right, that's it. That's enough. I've changed my mind. <laughs> End of story. And, you know, but what will they say? Oh, no, but you said, you promised us that we'd get an ice cream. Yeah? And sometimes our hearts will just melt. And we'll just say, oh, there you go. <laughs> promised us an ice cream. Anyway. But it's important to remember that through the process of time, you can disqualify yourself we can disqualify ourselves from the promises of God. Do you, do you, that is the truth. That is the, the, the truth that we can disqualify ourselves from those promises. God so wants to give you the promises. Okay, so there's a lot resting on us here. God's promises to you are bigger than the problems that you have. But we focus on the problems and not the promises. And this is, I bet you, this has been preached a gazillion times in the church. <laughs> God's promises are bigger than your problems. I know that. But it's not, it's not a bad thing to be reminded of that. You've better things in front of you. Yeah? You've much better things ahead of you. And you've got to um, hang on to that. And something, I had a light bulb uh, moment last night because I came up to the house quickly and had my meatballs. And uh, while I was there and I was scoffing my meatballs down, Evan Almighty was on the TV. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, I tell you what it was, it was only near the end of the film, but it was when the rainbow uh, came. You know, the, 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 the flood, the dam broke and the water came and everything. But then, and uh, you know, I believe that sometimes you're going to have rainbow moments in your life where God is like, that will never happen again. You know what God said? He, said? he said, never again will I cover the earth with a flood and wipe out mankind. Never, I will never do it again. Now, we, there, there are floods and there are disasters. But he says, I will never again cover the earth with a flood. So I believe that there will be rainbow moments in our lives. If we're positioned correctly where God will say, do you know what? You've been through that now. It's never going to happen to you again. Because some of us, get, we, we, we feel like we're in a cycle of re repeating, going through the same old thing. Yeah? And, you know, <clears throat> you do get to a place of total uh, frustration. You've tried everything. You're in, you're, 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 you've been pushed to, the, to your limit. Do you know, sometimes God is a way of taking you beyond your limit. You know, because my, my self-determined limit is not my limit, is not my real limit. My, I, I, that's where I set it because that's where I feel most comfortable. That's where I feel, Lord, I can operate at this level and I can keep all my, all my plates spinning and all my balls in the air and everything will be cool. And God's like, well, I'm just going to blow that out of the water just shortly. Because if you've said that you will follow me and you're committed to me, then I'm going to take you, I'm going to you reset that limiter on your life. You know, it's like on your motorcycle when that rev, when that, you know, you get right up to 10, 11,000 RPM and the engine automatically won't let it rev anymore, but it can. Do you know that that engine is set, it's governed to stop at that point. There's a rev limiter you, you, you maybe hear someone revving their car. Actually, it's great. If you want to hear revs, just come and sit here during the day. The college car park's just, just there. And all the guys are... And they're revving their cars up. And it's like, okay, either a car's going to blow up or something. But there's, there's like a, a limiter. But if you take that governor off, if you take that limiter off, that, in, that engine is capable of doing more. Okay? You're all capable. We are all capable of doing more. So, um, this is, uh, I, I was thinking about this and thinking, how can I encourage people this morning? And every, every Sunday, we always hope to leave the place encouraged, yeah? 
Um, and sometimes we think we're, we want to leave here with our answers. Like, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to leave with the answers to my problems. And sometimes that'll happen. Yeah? But sometimes you're in the process of getting your answers. Okay? It's better that I read this out because I can't remember my own st statement. <laughs> statement. You've cried out in desperation and frustration and said, what's the use? The answer isn't coming. But maybe you're answering what is required, follow me now, because you've endured the test and God says, that's enough. You've passed the test and I will not test you like that again. What I'm trying to say is maybe the process has been the, the answer is in the process. We are waiting for a definitive statement or something that says, there's your answer. But maybe God says, well, you know, what do you need to pass a test? Correct answers. Well, how do you pass a test? You answer the, an you answer the questions correctly. So sometimes it's in the process that we are living the answer. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I think this is a bit deep this morning. I should have double read that last night. <laughs> but God says that you've, uh, you're, you're in the process. And I've seen you. You've come out and you've answered what I've asked of you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And I will not test you like that again. Do you understand now what I'm trying to say? He says you've just in the, it, just by doing, just by being, and getting through this, you've answered my question. You've passed the test. Sometimes the answer is not at the destination, it's in the journey. Okay? Don't misunderstand what I'm saying just now. I'm not saying that you have to settle for where you are, what you've got, or what you haven't got. All right? What I'm saying is that you're, we're all in a process, okay? And I often think, wow, I've got so many whys that need answers, and hopefully one day God will fill in all the blanks of my life. Anyone think like that? One day, all of the blanks, I'm going, they're all going to be answered. Everything's going to be like the whole, the, see the join the dots. If the dots aren't any joined, and you're, Oh, all the dots aren't joined. I can't, it's like catchphrase. <laughs> I can't actually see what this is supposed to be. But it's because not everything joined up, you see. Here's what I believe. I believe I'm not even going to be concerned about it. By the grace of God, if I'm in glory, I will not even be caring about it. I'm not even going to be concerned with the wise, okay? And... Uh, that's, that's, that's good news, yeah? So, one of the answers to life's tests is to simply stay in the exam room. You know, um, if you get up in the middle of the exam, Rachel, if you get up in the middle of the exam and you walk out, you won't pass, okay? Stay in the, stay in the exam room. We've got to stay engaged with the promises that God is making to us, all right? We can't... We can't uh, walk away from, from them. Rachel has to go in to do her exam and stay engaged until she's finished. And then she'll get a result, okay? So God has promises with us that we need to stay engaged in, okay? So if anyone knows anything about Caleb and not the, the little red-headed boy that's in Texas right now, that Caleb, but the other Caleb, 45 years he had to stay engaged in the process, all right? I, I'm like only three years older than that. And I'm like, wow, man, even I think some seasons of life have been too long and too hard. 45 years he had to stay engaged. So does that give you some encouragement? I want to I remind you of the man at the pool of, of Bethsaida. Thank you, Barbara. Bethsaida. 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 He's waiting, he's, wait, he's at the pool and he's waiting on the angel. He's waiting on the angel coming to stir the waters. Lo and behold, the creator of angels, the creator himself 
the Son of God walks up to him, okay? He's waiting on an angel, and Jesus walks up to him. Jesus knew that that man had been there for how long? 38 years. 38 years. And he knew that the man was completely helpless. This man couldn't help himself. Do you remember the story? And you know what? There's, you, we, can, we, can, you, we can identify with that story of this man at the pool because he probably thinks, you know what? Nobody, think, nobody cares what, about what I'm going through and no one's really trying to help. Everyone was, as soon as the waters were stirred, it's every man for himself. You have to get there when the waters are stirred. You know, some of us might even be too embarrassed to share what we're going through, even with the people that are closest to us. And I, I, I want to just go off track for a, a, a brief moment. Try and overcome that. Try not to keep that locked away deep down inside you. Because there is such freedom. There is such freedom in giving that away. And giving that away, giving that up. Because sometimes we won't even go to our closest and tell them, I'm really, I've, I've got this situation going on in my life, or I had it, and I'm too embarrassed, and you're just too embarrassed to talk about it. I don't know why that was, was a note there, but it must be for somebody. And I, I know myself, even, you know, there's. Certain times in my life where I, where I went to my dad and in, 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 uh, just kind of in a wreck and just confessed, just confessed, just said, this is the, I'm struggling with this, confess, confess. And uh, two hours later ha have left with a, with a feeling of freedom. So I'd encourage you to, today, um, confide in a close friend. And, uh, or if you, if, you're, if you want counsel for anything, Come and see uh, Linda and I. I can assure you that everything that we counsel with with people is, in the, is held in the utmost confidence. So don't be isolated. So anyway, God knows all about what we are going through. Jesus knew exactly what this guy was going through. And uh, in his word in Acts 15 chapter 15, verse 18, it says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He knew everything. He knows everything. He's the Alpha and Omega. He knows, he knows the, the cause and he knows the cure. He knows the effects. He knows the ripples. He knows what's happening. He knows, he knows that if you do one thing, this is what it's going to cause. He knows everything. Do you believe that? He knows everything. And so uh, Jesus walks right up to this man because, you know, why didn't Jesus, you know, Jesus could have done a lot there that day, but he walked right up to that man and he took care of that man's need. Yeah? Basically, Jesus had already made a determination that that man would be healed that day. And what I want to say to you is that God's promises have a season and an appointed time for your life. And Jesus, God has already predetermined that there will be a day when your promise, you will walk into your promise. He's, that's already, and you know the Bible talks about uh, uh, due season, uh, all sorts of seasons. So there's seasons, and, and so I want to encourage you this morning, because I'm going to take this to part two next week and not go for much longer, that if you're in the process, stay engaged with God's promises and don't let go, okay? Because you, you don't give up, and you've heard this a thousand times, I know it. Don't give up. God's promises are on their way, okay? And we're already experiencing God's promises. Do you know what I'm saying? We, we experience the goodness of God every day. Remember last, uh, two weeks ago, we said, uh, we went through those five steps, you know, reading, uh, no, hearing, reading, memorizing, meditating, I think I missed one, studying, yeah. We've got to do that with God's promises. We've got to pick up his word and go, do you know what, just go Google God's promises and get a list 
for your Bible or go and use a particular color of marker pen, all right? And in your Bible, just go and do the whole um, fluorescent marker pen thing. It was really cool this morning. I didn't know this before, but when you use an orange fluorescent marker pen, the words come off the page in these lights. (laughs) So... Um, Use a marker pen that's a particular color and go and highlight God's promises, all right? Engage with them, read them, study them, declare them. That's what we're going to be doing at corporate prayer tonight. We're going to be declaring God's promises. Everyone who comes to corporate prayer tonight is going to have a confession sheet. And we are going to declare God's word tonight. And that's what we're going to do for corporate prayer. We're going to declare his word and we're going to pray about it. Amen. Declaring is most important. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And remember at the start, I I talked about being snared by the words of our mouth. Well, according to Proverbs chapter six, verse two, we're going to be snared tonight by all of the words that we speak. And they're going to be good. They're going to be, they're going to be words of life. So, Let me finish off with this. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, it says, He who overcomes, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Who will he confess? Whose name will stay in that, in that scroll of remembrance? He who overcomes. He who overcomes. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you feel like you've been undercoming, all right, or you've been overwhelmed, then you can get back right side up and you can live an overcoming life. Amen? Because God has promised things to us and his promises should make us act differently. You know, when, when I promise something to my kids, that produce, you know, they act differently once the promise has been made and I act differently. Yeah? What do they act like? Expectation. It's like there's a promise coming. You know, they begin to act, behave differently when they sense that there's a promise there. And the promise giver also acts differently because you now have to come good on the promise. Yeah? And so once the promise is made, both the promiser and uh, this is a good word, the promisee, I don't know if that's even right. I've made it up. The promisee will go through various stages of preparation and expectation until the promise is fulfilled. And if God is like that, the same way. If he's promised it, he will fulfill it. Yeah. So let's just go back to Malachi uh, chapter 3, verse 13. There are two categories of people out there. The first category, complaining all the time. What's the point? What's the good in keeping on going with this? It's just a waste of time. I'm just, you know what? I'm just that far away from just chucking, chucking it. You know what? So that's one category. Who are the other category? They're committed. They're engaged. They've been through the delay. They've been through the struggle. They've been through the process. They've been through the waiting, but they've never given up. Two completely different categories of people. Do you know, if we just go back to that, what did it say at the start? It says, you, the, God is saying, you have spoken terrible things about me. Do you know, there are people that will turn on their leaders and on God just in a blink of an eye. They'll despise them. They'll rail against them. And they'll say, yeah. And we're in good company because Moses experienced it. All of these great generals of God experienced that that category of people. But then it came to God's doorstep. God, you. And he's like, like, hang on. You are speaking terribly about me. Let's address the issue right now. 
And so this morning, I want to encourage you, God remembers he remembers everything. Every, he, he remembers every idle word. He remembers every good word. God is a recorder of things. Do you believe that? He, he you know, I always remember this uh, because you know, one time I thought, you know, why is it so important? Why is it really that important how big the church, how many people come to church? I'm, I'm ashamed to say that my mindset was, do you know what? It, it doesn't really, if we, if we get 100 people, it's great. If we get 500 people, it's great. It's, 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 it's wrong to think like that. You know, God had a recording angel. Every single person is precious to him. Every single name is precious. So I can't take that opinion, well, it's, do you know what? Th that many people is fine. We'll, that'll, we'll, that'll be fine. Because, you know, you can go to, there'll be other churches and things like that. God says, no, I want you to be concerned with numbers. Because numbers are important to me. Numbers are important to God. So we should never just say, oh, do you know what? It's, it's fine the way it is. It's not fine. God records things. He's a recorder and he's a rewarder. And he's looking to reward you for... Um, He's looking to reward you for, for so many things. So many things. He's looking for an opportunity to reward you. So praise God. I'm going to just stop it there because I've got so much more on the promises of God and I'm going to finish it next week and I've got a great story for you next week. So please come. <laughs> He's trying to get us back to church again. So come to church because there's going to be a good story in the mix too. Um, so go away this week and, and, and meditate and study in Malachi chapter 3 and um, make a decision on which, in, you know, don't be in the category of the, of the gossipers and the despisers and the people that just, you know, sometimes we just, and sometimes we say things because we're, deeply, in a deeply emotional place or we're hurting. And we turn around and we say, I didn't really mean that. I didn't really mean it. But your words have an effect. And that just brought to mind something about an old man who brought an accusation against his neighbor. And... Uh, he went and he accused his neighbor of doing something and began to spread the word that his neighbor had done X and X wrong. So anyway, he was confronted by the neighbor and the neighbor says, you've caused me so much damage and so much grief. And the, the guy says, well, you know what? You know, I kind of made it up anyway. So the guy says, well, I want to take you before a judge. We're going to sort this out because you've caused so much damage to me. So he, the guy, they go, they go before a judge and the judge says to the old man, you said something about this man and it's, it's caused him a lot of damage and it's, it's unlikely that he'll be able to recover from it. His reputation has been destroyed. You've, you've uh, cast aspersions against his name. So I want you to... Um, I want you to be held accountable for that. And the guy says, oh, well, okay, well, I, di I didn't really mean it. Um, so do you know what? It's, it's, surely it's not such a big deal. And the judge says to him, when, when you leave here tonight, I want you to take a bit of paper and I want, you to, uh, I want you to write the accusation on that piece of paper. And when you're driving home in the car tonight, I want you to rip that bit of paper up into 100 pieces and throw it out of the window. And then I want you to come back and see me. So the man wrote the accusation on the bit of paper. He got in his car. He ripped it up into 100 pieces. And when he was driving along the motorway, he threw the piece of paper out the window. The next time he went back to the judge, the judge says to him, okay, can you please, uh, can you please go now and go and bring me back that bit of paper that I, that I asked you to write and tear up and throw out? And the man says, what are you talking about? You're crazy. I'll never be able to go and get all of that because the wind have, will have carried all of those bits of paper and everything away all over the place. 
Do you get the illustration? Even if you don't mean something, even if you say something out of, out of a hurt or out of pain, sometimes it can do irreparable damage, but it's too late. You've said it. And that's why we need to keep a guard at the door of our lips so that we don't just toss out words there that can um, harm other people's lives because we're looking to get something off of our chest. Do you understand that this morning? Amen. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.